So back in the day, we were taught that there are four eukaryotic kingdoms, plants, animals, fungi, and the protista. This last kingdom, the protists, was divided into the protozoa, the algae, and some mold-like things that didn't qualify to be real fungi, and this included the water molds and the slime molds. Now, even though this is not a reasonable organization, given our current knowledge of phylogenetic relationships, some people still use these terms as if they are valid taxonomic names, perhaps out of inertia, which is really just laziness and not wanting to revise one's understanding in light of better information, or, and this is a more charitable interpretation, because of the appeal of having divisions of protists corresponding to the animal-like, which are the protozoa, the plant-like, algae, and the fungus-like. In our class, we'll see that some of these names are fundamentally flawed to the point of being misleading. I'm going to be giving you names that match up with our current understanding of the relationships among the eukarya. And the downside to being true to the science here will be that these groupings of organisms, the clades, will not always be a cluster of taxa that bear any obvious morphological similarities. You should be prepared to take notes on some fantastical sounding taxonomic names and the sometimes obscure characteristics that unite the members of the clade. Sometimes there may not even be a good synapomorphy apart from the molecular sequence data. Unfortunately, this is going to make things a little harder to keep straight in terms of who's related to whom. And it's for this reason that I strongly suggest that you record the layout of the tree in your notes carefully for later study. The textbook's phylogeny for the eukarya recognizes four major clades, the excavata, the SAR supergroup, consisting of three distinct subclades, the Straminopolis, the Elveolata, and the Rhizaria, the Archaeplastida, and the Uniconta. Think of these as the four major limbs of the eukarya part of the tree of life. Remember that these groupings are strongly supported by molecular sequence homology. In my experience, Campbell's biology does a really outstanding job of staying on top of the continual flow of new taxonomic information. The excavata limb of the eukarya has two sublimbs, branches, if you prefer, that we'll discuss. One of these branches is thematically adapted to anaerobic conditions, and consequently these cells have lost the typical mitochondria that we know and love. For most cells, the mitochondrion serves as a site of aerobic respiration, and because these cells are now living under no oxygen conditions, there's no reason for such organisms to waste resources by continuing to make mitochondria. Our first group on this half of the excavata is the parabacellida, flagellated anaerobes living in the anaerobic spaces within animals. I've already told you about the gut, but other spaces like the urogenital tract are also anaerobic. These areas are not served by a blood supply and contain enough of a microbiome to rapidly consume any O2 that happens to get in. Our first parabacellid, Myxotrica, makes its home in the guts of certain termites. This was a favorite topic of Lynn Bargulis. We talked about her in the last video. Now among the insects that are already the most successful and diverse form of animals on the earth, the termites are very successful and diverse in their own right, and they include some forms that are highly derived, like the ones in the woodwork of your house, maybe, as well as some forms that are basal and comparatively primitive in the sense of having a lot of ancestral characteristics. The sister tax under the termites are the roaches, and the basal or more primitive forms of termites have a cockroach-like appearance. Mastotermes is one of these roach-like termites from northern Australia. Now, Myxotrica paradoxa, living in the guts of these termites, is what allows them to get energy from eating wood. Cellulose, the main component of wood, is not digestible by most animals like humans. We lack the cellulase enzymes needed to hydrolyze the bonds holding together the sugar molecules in the cellulose polymer. When we eat plant material, whatever cellulose is there in the plant cell walls passes right through us as dietary fiber. Now the parabacellate mixotrica is capable of breaking down cellulose, and so what happens is either the termite lets the mixotrica get fat on the cellulose, and then the termite digests it, 
or perhaps there's some kind of arrangement in which the parabacillin releases to the termite some of its glucose, sort of as an exchange for not getting eaten by the host termite. Now here's plot twist number one. I've said that Mixotreca breaks down the cellulose, but it doesn't actually produce the cellulase on its own. Its genome doesn't have any genes coding for cellulase. It gets the enzyme from intracellular cellulase-positive bacteria that it harbors within its cytoplasm. Mixotric uses the bacteria to break down the cellulose, while the termite uses the mixotric. And you can see why Margulis love these guys so much. It's like endosymbiosis on steroids. Bacterial cell living within the eukaryotic microbe, living within the termite. Kind of like those nested dolls from Russia. And here's plot twist number two. You see all those hairs around the cell? Only two or maybe four of them are actually flagella that belong to the mixed trick. The rest are spirochetes from the termite's gut that attach to the eukaryote and are somehow made to beat rhythmically, allowing the cell to be propelled around in the microbe's gut habitat. The mixotrick uses its own flagella more as rudders than as actual propulsion structures. Remember how he said that Margulis was convinced that flagella and cilia are derived from spirochetes? This mixotrick is one of a handful of modern oddities that inspired her and actually sold her fully on this idea. The other parabacillid in her survey is Trichomonas. Trichomonas vaginalis is the cause of the sexually transmitted disease trichomoniasis, or trich. It's like Mixotricha, but lacking all of the cooler features like associations with spirochetes and cellulose digesting bacteria. And instead, it lives in the urogenital tracts of mammals and is transmitted from host to host by sexual contact. Now, the reason I'm including trichomonads is a way that they've repurposed the mitochondria. Remember that being anaerobes, these cells have no use for typical mitochondria. In the case of trichomonads, there's a structure called a hydrogenosome that is barely recognizable, but it is a highly derived mitochondrion that's become specialized to generate hydrogen gas, H2, as a part of the anaerobes ATP synthesis. Now here we actually have two bits of evidence for the existence of mitochondria, the normal mitochondria, in the cell's evolutionary past. There are the physical remains in the form of hydrogenosomes, and also the genetic remnants of the mitochondrial genes in the nuclear genome. Now sharing this sublim of the excavata with the parabacillids are the diplomonads, which are also anaerobic with highly reduced mitochondria. We're only talking about one example here, and it's Giardia. And this is an organism that you should be aware of because it's widespread in the United States carried by wild animals as well as companion animals like dogs and cats, and it's commonly contracted by hikers who are careless about treating stream water before drinking. As I said, this parasite is relatively common in wildlife and can pass from a zoonotic reservoir like a beaver or a deer to humans via fecally contaminated water. The main symptom is a severe diarrhea that comes up quickly and often when someone is in the backcountry a long hike away from the trailhead. Now the thematic characteristic for this half of the excavata limb, including parabacillids and diplomonads, is the adaptation to anaerobic habitats and the complete absence of normal mitochondria. Being anaerobes and thus metabolically distinguishable from our cells, both giardiasis and trichomoniasis are usually treated with metronidazole, a trade name flagell, a drug that targets the anaerobic pathways used by these cells, making it possible to specifically target this one group of eukaryotic cells, the parasite, without affecting the eukaryotic cells of the host's body. The other part of the excavate clade of the tree of life is the euglenozoa, and this includes some members that are primarily photosynthetic, like the euglena we probably saw in the laboratory. Being photosynthetic free-living eukaryotes, the euglenids in times past would have been classified in the algae. There's also a non-photosynthetic side of the euglenozoa, and this is the kinetoplasida, represented by the parasitic genus Trypanosoma. Two species of Trypanosoma are of note to us. Trypanosoma brucei is the cause of African sleeping sickness, while Trypanosoma cruzi is the cause of Chagas' disease seen in the Americas. 
Both are transmitted by arthropod vectors. The tsetse fly in the case of Trypanosoma brucei, and triatomine bugs in the case of Trypanosoma cruzi. This kissing bug vector of Chagas' disease is now known to be present in the United States, including Southern California, and so it's conceivable that this tropical disease might at some point soon become established within our own borders. Both Chagas disease and African sleeping sickness are in the category of avoid these at all costs because of how difficult they are to treat. Trypanosomes have this trick of changing their surface antigens in a way to keep them one step ahead of the immune defenses of vertebrate hosts. Given that your immune system has basically been outsmarted by these parasites, the conditions they cause are lethal if left untreated. Moreover, being eukaryotic and therefore metabolically the same in many ways as our own cells, this severely limits the options for chemical therapies, drugs. Things that are toxic to the trypanosomes are also going to be toxic to our cells. Now, Giardia and Trick are no fun at all, but at least we can target the anaerobic nature of their cells. This is not an option with trypanosomes. The only thing we can do is to use chemicals that are pretty nasty, like some that are based on the heavy metal antimony. It's toxic to us, but even more toxic to the trypanosome parasites. When you think about the excavata as a clade, it should strike you as odd that Euglena and Trypanosoma should be classified together into the same group, and that these cells should be sister to anaerobic forms like Giardia and Trick. Now, the molecular sequences of these organisms validate beyond doubt their common ancestry from a species that's more recent than any shared by other kinds of eukaryotes. But otherwise, they seem like a weird hodgepodge of dissimilar protists. Now, the name excavata was coined specifically for this group because of an excavated ventral feeding structure, which is totally not an important aspect of the biology, but rather a minor trait that happens to be held in common by its members. This theme of naming clades after seemingly trivial and unimportant traits is something that we'll be seeing a lot of in this lecture as well as in future lectures. Leaving the excavata behind now, we'll consider the SAR supergroup that consists of three subclades, the stramenopiles or straminopolis if you prefer, the alveolata, and the rhizaria. The stramenopiles include photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic, microscopic unicellular and macroscopic multicellular forms, and thus carries on with the tradition of having dissimilar life forms clustered into the same taxon. The diatoms, our first group, are important planktors, photosynthetic algae with silica-rich cells that live in the photic zones of oceans, and when they die, their shells settle out in massive quantities on the ocean bottom. When these sediments, sometimes meters and meters thick, are later exposed as the outcome of uplift, sea level changes, and erosion, this diatomaceous earth may be harvested and used for pool filters, natural insecticides, and kitty litter. Personally, I use diatomaceous earth, DE, to dust my chickens when I think they might have lice or mites, and also my plants in the spring when they get infected by aphids. The tiny fragments of diatom shells are like microscopic glass shards that cut into and penetrate the shells of the insects, as well as mites, which aren't really insects, and cause them to dehydrate. The brown algae, or the theophyta, are the large marine plants that most of you know of as kelp. For us here in Southern California, brown algae dramatically impact the ecology for inshore sea life by providing three-dimensional shelter and habitat for whole marine communities, much in the way that coral reefs provide structural protection for sea life in their parts of the ocean. Macrocystis pyrifera is the main species in our local kelp forests. Now, when the kelp is healthy, the sea life is rich in abundance and in diversity. And when the kelp is destroyed, either by sea urchins or El Nino storms, the sea life suffers badly. Our third group of stramenopelian organisms is the Omycota, or water molds. And it's unlike the other two that we've discussed in being heterotrophic and fungus-like, 
rather than phototrophic and plant-like. Some oomycetes include fish parasites attacking a fish after its protective slime layer has been compromised. If you ever catch a fish and plan to release it, you shouldn't use a towel to hold it while you're taking out the hook. If you do so, you wipe off slime and you're basically killing the fish, so you might as well throw it into your sack and have it later as a taco. One other very important oomycete is the plant pathogen Phytophthora, which is one from a long list of crop problems of huge economic significance to humans. In one very real way, this oomycete changed the dynamics of the human population when it resulted in the Irish potato famine 1845 to 1849. The arrival of massive numbers of Irish immigrants to the New World, largely Canada and the U.S., changed the cultural landscape, especially in cities in the U.S. Despite being heterotrophic, the oomycetes do bear genomic evidence of the past with chloroplasts, cyanobacterial genes in its nuclear genome, and thus its photosynthetic capability was probably lost as it evolved as a parasite. These observations suggest a narrative in which photosynthesis evolved only once in the Stramonopolis, near or prior to the most recent common ancestor, and was subsequently lost within the oomycetes. I said earlier that there seems to be only a single origin of chloroplasts from cyanobacteria, and this still holds true despite the fact that Stramonopolis also became photosynthetic by virtue of an endosymbiont. Now this may seem contradictory, but it's accurate, given that the endosymbiont becoming the chloroplast for the Straminopelian common ancestor was already eukaryotic, probably a unicellular red alga, which is in the Archaeoplastida and has cyanobacterially derived chloroplasts. Again, this reminds us of those Russian Matryoshka dolls, cyanobacterium living inside of a red alga, living inside the Straminopile like a brown alga. The term Stramenopiles or Stramenopolis is more than just a funny sounding word. It's a name that was only recently coined, again to account for the unity of organisms as disparate as unicellular diatoms, multicellular kelps, and heterotrophic parasites like oomycetes. Their molecular sequences are what told us together they formed a clade, but what to call this clade? Is there any unifying characteristic besides the sequences of A, C, T, and G in their genes that unite them as separate from everybody else? Well, it turns out that their flagella, when they have flagella, have an unusual pattern of being paired and different. One flagellum is normal, with a single smooth shaft, while the other has the appearance of a hair that's badly damaged and split-ended. Strameno means straw, like in hay, which has a tendency to break down into finer fibers, while piles, or piles, means hairs. Straminopolis are the cells with split ends on one of their two hairs. Another term sometimes used for the same clade is heterocont, that is, different poles. Hetero being different, and cont is the root word for flagella in these cells. Now we think of the poles that people use to push around punts, you know, the little boats. Anyways, these cells use flagella, much in the same way that a punter uses his or her pole. The A in SAR stands for alveolata, and the unifying characteristic here is alveoli, tiny cavities or vesicles that are either numerous or otherwise very significant in these unicellular organisms. There are three groups of alveolates that we'll focus on. The first is the ciliata, or the ciliate cells that we've seen in the laboratory. As I mentioned before, the ultrastructure of a cilium and a flagellum is basically the same. The main differences between cilia and flagella are A, the number typically present on the cell. Flagella are relatively few, while cilia are many. And B, the direction that the water is pushed. Cilia sweep water and the particles contained in the water laterally across the cell surface, while flagella use sinusoidal waves to push the water either toward the cell or away from the cell. Ciliates are abundant and diverse in most aquatic habitats and range in ecology from small detritus feeders to large predators, large, that is, relative to other microbes, 
some of them being big enough to even to prey on multicellular animals. The second group of alveolates is the dinoflagellates. These are organisms that sometimes have enormously complex life cycles with photosynthetic and heterotrophic stages, but they're typically thought of as photosynthetic cells and associated with red tides. If you've been around Southern California long enough, you've experienced a red tide event during which the ocean water near the shore turns a murky reddish brown and gets kind of stinky. A red tide is basically an algal bloom triggered by some constellation of temperature, water chemistry, and often an influx of nutrients from runoff. We're lucky that the usual culprit for our red tides in Southern California is a relatively innocuous Lingulodinium polyedrum, and not the Fisteria piscicida killer of fish seen in some East Coast red tide events. Now, a couple of interesting facts about dinoflagellates. Many are capable of bioluminescence that can be triggered by agitating the cell or mildly compressing the cell wall, which results in a breaking of internal vesicles, the alveoli, containing bioluminescent material. This mixes with the cytoplasm to create a light-emitting reaction. During a red tide, you can witness this by going to the beach on a dark night and watching the waves light up as they crash, or seeing your footsteps in the wet sand as they glow behind you. Another interesting factoid about dinoflagellates is that some of the more serious forms of red tides, like Visteria, are really quite dangerous, not only killing fish, but also releasing enough neurotoxins to affect humans that just breathe in the ocean mist. Some scholars, in fact, argue that the first plague of Egypt, as described in the Old Testament, actually fits pretty well with the Visteria bloom. The water of the Nile shall turn to blood, the fish will die, and the Nile will stink. And if this is true, it would actually make the Bible the earliest known documentation of a red tide event. Now to me, this makes a lot more sense than the Nile literally turning into a river of O positive. Okay, so the third group of alveolates we'll cover is the apicomplexa, which includes a wide array of parasites having in common a special organelle, the apical complex, that allows the penetration of a host cell. Malaria is a disease that we associate with mosquitoes, but it's actually the apicomplexan parasite, plasmodium, that's transmitted by mosquitoes that causes damage to our physiologies when we suffer from malaria. Another apicomplexan parasite is Toxoplasma gondii, the cause of toxoplasmosis, a disease of concern for prenatal care and also a cause of human mortality during the AIDS epidemic. For an adult human with a normally functioning immune system, Toxoplasma is a minor annoyance, causing either mild symptoms or none at all. However, to immunocompromised patients, of which there are many during the AIDS crisis years, Toxoplasma is deadly. Fetuses also have undeveloped immune systems, and unlike most pathogens, Toxoplasma can relatively easily cross the placental barrier, getting from the mother circulation into the fetus. And when this happens, you've got a serious health concern. Now for the interesting side story. Humans were not the intended host for Toxoplasma. The normal cycle of infection revolves around the parasite's definitive host, house cats. This is why it's only pregnant cat owners that receive special instructions to prevent toxoplasmosis during the period in which the baby is susceptible. The normal cycle goes like this. An infected cat poops out an infectious phase called the oocyst. These oocysts get ingested by a rodent, a mouse or a rat, that eats something contaminated by the feces from the infected cat, and it becomes the intermediate host. The cycle gets completed when the toxoplasma-carrying rodent then gets eaten by another cat. Humans are not supposed to be in the picture at all, except for the fact that our physiology is evidently close enough to that of a mouse for us to be intermediate hosts. And if you happen to be a cat owner, you have a relatively high likelihood of contacting the oocysts, either in the litter box or in soil where your cat has left its stinky little nuggets. And now the side story has a devious plot twist. 
We know that Toxoplasma uses mind control on its intermediate rat hosts to make the rat or mouse more likely to get eaten. The infected rodent acts reckless around cats. Now it's not really that hard to alter the behavior of your host. All you need to do is to release the right chemicals into the blood. And Toxoplasma does exactly this to their mouse hosts. If the mouse dies by any other means, the Toxoplasma simply decomposes with the mouse's corpse. Success for the parasite is achieved only when the mouse dies and gets eaten by a cat. The intriguing question here is whether or not there's any altered behavior occurring in humans infected by Toxoplasma after contamination by cat poop. The research that has been conducted on this topic is quite interesting. But we're getting pretty far off the main topic, and so I'll leave that out there as a teaser, and anybody who wants more information can go and Google up what the findings have been so far. Now the R in SAR stands for Rhizaria, and I'm just going to point out that we've already talked about Rhizarial organisms in the past, back in Unit 1 when we discussed the evolutionary trends and Cope's rule as it pertained to the foraminifera. Yeah, forams, they're in the Rhizaria, as is another very interesting and pretty unicellular planktonic entity shown here called a radiolarian. So that's going to be all for our survey of the first two major clades of the eukarya, the excavata and the SAR-SAR supergroup. We'll talk about the other two major clades, the archiplastida and the uniconta, in the next lecture.